Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Today we're going to talk about the new Slash Les Paul Standard. The Slash Collection was introduced the first week of 2020 as a core collection that is here to stay of Slash-inspired instruments. So these are not limited editions, but it appears a few of the colors might come and go year to year. But this is just a new thing that Gibson is doing with their global brand ambassador. So there's four Les Pauls and two J45s in this collection, which is the first signature acoustic guitar for Slash by Gibson. These are essentially just based off of a 50s collection Les Paul standard, and those things retail at $2,499. Whereas, once you put the Slash affiliation with it, these cost $2,999. So, what is the difference, and is it worth the $500 extra? That is the topic we're going to discuss today. There are six main features that are different between the Slash collection and the original collection Les Paul standards. First off, you get Slash's preferred C-neck profile shape. Now, I haven't actually owned one of the 50s Les Paul standards, but I did do the 60s, but I was able to compare that on launch day at Sweetwater between the 50s and 60s, and this neck feels like it's almost like in between those two. So it's not quite super, super thick, but it's definitely nowhere near as slim as the 60s standard. So I think this would appeal to people that both like big necks as well as the small necks. It's nothing too crazy here. Perhaps the biggest feature here are the pickups are different. These have what they're calling the slash buckers. So it's basically just a Gibson version of his old signature Seymour Duncans. The next slashy feature they have here is the back of the headstock has a Scully decal, but all his old signature guitars had that on the face of the headstock. So that's something that makes it still a slash guitar, but it's not like in your face. This has to be a slash signature. So that's great because you can still make this your own, even if you're not a slash fan. The truss rod cover does have a signature on it, but they do include a blank one in the case if you wish to change that. Other than that, from the factory, these actually come with Slash's preferred Ernie Ball strings that are new, and you get a little baggie of signature picks. So besides the pickups and the neck profile, the only other big difference between these two comes down to the finishes. You can choose between four different colors on these guys in a triple A flame maple top. Now, some of them are a lot flamier than others, like this one's a pretty prime example. I've seen some that are pretty plain as well. But the colors that appear to be here to stay include November Burst and the Appetite Burst. But then as far as the limited edition side of things go, they've introduced an Anaconda Burst, which they've actually already done in 2018, so that's kind of a reissue color of that. And then they've got this Vermilion Burst color, which is kind of a cool red burst. There is a custom shot version of this guitar planned called the Bolivian Burst. So from the way I understand the website, these are the two colors that are going to come in and out and they're going to change things year to year. And that's how they'll keep the Slash collection fresh and who knows what else they might introduce in this in the coming years. So to sum all that up, yeah, you get a few Slash specs here and you get a few Slash signature things on the guitar. So let's go ahead and talk about my first impressions of this Vermilion Burst. I was really, really looking forward to this model. And I always just thought this Vermilion Burst looked really cool on stage the way he had it. I thought it had a black border though, but it's not. It's like just a really dark red. So in my opinion, I'm not digging this finish as much in person as I did in photos because it just kind of appears really, really red. But you can see when it catches the shadows, it kind of looks like the old dark wine burst finish from the 90s. So it's cool, I love this flame top, just not quite what I was expecting. And it's a pretty heavy guitar. That's kind of the whole thing of these things coming back with solid bodies on them. There's no weight relief on these. So you can find some examples that weigh about nine pounds. I think this one's about nine and a half. It's kind of luck of the draw when it comes to that. And Gibson tends to get knocked for quality control issues, but I have looked this guitar up and down. I mean, we still have to tear it apart and see what I find inside. But the only thing that I could find wrong with this guitar is there's like a ding or something underneath the finish on the side of the headstock. Really, the only thing bad I can say about this new Slash series is has nothing to do with the guitar. It actually has to do with the case. Gibson has switched manufacturing of their Gibson cases to China, which we'll go over a little bit later on what the differences are between these and the older cases. I think it's kind of a bad move on their part, but I definitely don't want that to be the main topic of today's video. So let's go ahead, throw it on the workbench, tear it apart, take a look at its individual parts and specs, and learn all about this guitar. Inside the Slash Les Paul standard here, let's uncover its secrets. So the pickups as advertised are the rhythm slash bucker in the neck, and then you have the lead slash bucker in the bridge. You're going to notice directly from the factory, the patent applied for actually came worn 
turn off. I've actually seen that on used Gibsons. It's very reassuring to know that it does happen, but maybe that's something Gibson can work on. Because if that falls off and this little sticker falls off, it's really hard to identify these things. But it is a short neck tenon in here, and it does say something along the lines of like Les Paul Slash in there. But as far as the routes go, good job, Gibson. You guys have really cleaned those up. Sometimes you find some pretty messy routes on those. So everything's actually looking pretty good within the cavities here. But it appears that they might need some help drilling their holes. I'm not sure if that's a filled in location or if that's just where the finish chipped. But right here, you can actually see there was definitely another hole at one point in time because you can see the light shine through it right there. <laughs> it seems like some of these were sunk rather crooked. A huge deal, no, but just letting you guys know. And then they have the uh, the faux BR1, as I like to call them. So it's like Nashville style studs with the ABR1 bridge itself. So it's kind of a blending between their two flagship models, but it gets you the look of a historic, but it's not mounted historically. But I do appreciate the fact that Gibson has at least put a disclaimer on their website that explains this new Gibson USA version of the ABR1 bridge. As far as the tailpiece goes, Advanced Plating Incorporated branded, and this is super lightweight aluminum. I mean, there's like no weight to this thing at all. You also have the knob pointers here that are rounded off so they don't cut you. And on this particular version of the Slash model, you have these black bell style knobs. And despite not being installed at the factory, these do come with a black one-ply pick guard if you wish to install it. And get this, after I made my video of the 60s standard that showed that it had a big old ding in the finish brand new from the factory. I'm sure there were a bunch of other complaints too about that. So they, they've started to use these little felt washers to help protect against that. So it's nice that they include that on the one that most people probably will never even install. But just in case you're curious, it would look like this with the pick guard on. Honestly, I think this is one of those few times in my life where I'm a pick guard off guy on this one. But I did notice that the uh, the plastic looks rather rough on the back side of this. But as far as wood construction goes, you can see the mahogany body right there with the two piece maple top that's specked out as a triple A flame. This one's actually a really nice example. It's got pretty even flaming all about. But my favorite feature about this one is right here. It's like a nice little mineral deposit right there that kind of looks like an eye. As far as the neck goes, you have a rosewood fretboard with 22 medium jumbo frets. You've got the acrylic inlays right here. And typically on brand new Gibsons, what you'll find is a bunch of tooling marks along the edges of the fretboard. I'm happy to let you guys know they are definitely cracking down on that a little bit, or this is just a better example. The only thing that I could find that's really nitpicky is they messed up this fret nib. You see, it's too long. You need to take a razor blade and cut that down a little bit. But everything else was pretty much shaped correctly. You just have very, very minor tooling marks in a few areas. Sometimes you can find examples that are really chewed up along the edges. This one's actually pretty nice though. But as far as neck specs go, your nut width is 1.69 inches, 12th fret to 2.09. First fret neck depth 0.89 and by the 12th 0.97. So that definitely makes it pretty beefy. Scale length is your typical 24 and 3 quarter inches with the standard 12 inch radius. And within the circuit, the bridge pickup, that's pretty hot. 8.59 and then neck 8.26. So these are definitely a little bit different from a PAF style. 4.21 in the middle. And here's a good look at both of the truss rod covers that are included with these. You have the one with Slash's signature and the one that's just completely blank. Your truss rod is right there if you need to use it. And just your regular Les Paul style headstock here. Moving on to the back here, we got a few cool things. So it appears, to me anyways, that's a one piece back, not a multi piece back. I'm sure some of them are two pieces. Or they just did a really, really good job hiding that seam line, but I ran my light along the edges. I did not see anything. But looking inside here really makes me happy that we're back to the original style wiring. This really does remind me of opening up like an early 2000s era Les Ball standard. So you just have the Gibson branded pots there with orange drop caps and it's all hand wired. So good stuff there. And then we move over to the toggle switch cavity. Just like that Epiphone, we had this mishap at the factory where they drilled it two different ways. <laughs> So you've got one securing right there, and then seemingly for no reason it was secured like that. I'd be curious what causes that, because I'm sure they don't do that by hand. I'm sure it's by machine, so. so maybe it's like the wrong program gets installed and they just fix it or something? I'd be interested to hear Gibson's comments on that. We've got some more rough looking plastic here. And then there's this small area by the back control cavity. It's not a ding, it's not a chip. I'm not sure what it is, it just looks strange. 
But moving along the edges here, we have a plastic output jack plate and Schaller strap lock button stock. That's something else you get on the slash over the original 50 standard. And you've got the historic thin binding in the cutaway. But moving along to the neck here, nothing too crazy going on here. It's just one piece mahogany. Once again, you've got your scully on the back with Gibson Cluson Deluxe style tuners. And this is a true 2020 guitar. It was made the 14th day of the year, 125th in production, the first batch. As far as playability, right out of the box, I'm noticing some G-string issues here. Listen to it. It's vibrating against something. I can't film and play at the same time, but I think you guys will get the idea here. Even when you fret the note, there's a little bit of a choke to it. That might just be some sort of setup issue because there's already a decent amount of relief in the neck so i don't think it has anything to do with fret clearance based on relief or anything like that or action because all the other strings are fine fully assembled this thing weighs nine pounds 7.8 ounces so just about nine and a half pounds let's go ahead plug it in and hear how it sounds <laughs> Now that we know all about the Slash Les Paul standard, what are my final thoughts on this thing? I was actually really impressed with these new Slash Bucker pickups. I didn't know what to really expect. There's a few demos that I wasn't necessarily floored with, but in person, just plugging it into my deluxe reverb, it's like, oh, okay, I can see how that's Slash tone a little bit. Obviously, I can use a lot of help when it comes to playing and dialing in tone, but just a basic setup is like, okay, yeah, that, that definitely works. I think Gibson's onto something here. And I think that's the main reason why you're gonna buy one of these. It comes down to the cool finishes that are available as well as the new slash bucker pickups were there a few qc things that they could have done better on this guitar yeah but most of them are really insignificant and kind of nitpicky the only thing i have a big issue with is the uh, nut clearance potentially I mean, it's not too bad most people probably wouldn't notice it too much but i think it's something that could have been dialed in a little bit better the finish is pretty cool here and it plays well it sounds great so is it worth 500 dollars more than the les paul standard 50s or 60s in my opinion, I enjoyed my Les Paul Standard 60s just a, a little bit better than this one. And I think that's because it's a more of a traditional color. It felt more like a burst. This is something that's more modern and edgy. So I think it depends on what you're going for there and never, 
ever underestimate the power of a signature guitar. Sometimes the best part of playing guitar is the inspiration that you can get from other artists. So if you can draw inspiration from Slash by having this guitar as well as build something on your own, yes, it's definitely worth the $500 premium. You're either a person that understands signature guitars or you don't, but there really is a phenomenon behind them. Because I'm not the best guitar player, but whenever I strap a Zach Wilde guitar on, I feel like a powerhouse. <laughs> so if you get something from Slash, definitely check these things out. I'd say these are a welcome new addition to the Gibson family lineup. But let's go ahead and check it out under blacklight. It appears my shirt has a bunch of fluff or something on it. <laughs> but as far as the finish goes, it's a pretty new guitar. It's not going to glow too much. Yep, nothing too much going on back here. Not even the scully, but you get a little bit on the tuners as well as the nut and truss rod cover. But now let's go ahead and check out this case. Here it is, the new Gibson Les Paul case. I mean, it might not look that much different on the outside, but there's quite a few things that are different. But let's just take a look at basic features. So one, two, three, four, and a fifth back latch. The exterior still has that kind of brown Tolex to it. The handle, it actually has a little bit more padding to it. So that's actually kind of a nice feature right there. And the interior, it's not quite as red as the cases last year. It's kind of returned more to that slightly pinkish hue, but just a little bit more on the red side. So I think people will be okay with that. It's still a nice case. It's got decent padding support right here. It still has a double neck rest, so everything's good there. You have a compartment in here, which seems to be fairly decent size, and you get a bunch of case candy with this one. The most important pieces of case candy are the Slash Tortex picks. The new case key at the Gibson multi-tool as well as the Schaller strap lock buttons. Warranty, polishing cloth, there's your pick guard again as well as the uh, truss rod cover. You also get a Gibson strap as well as the baby photo owner's manual and this pre-pack checklist. That's one thing Gibson does really well. They outcase candy everybody else. And as far as the rest of the case here, I mean, it still has some padding here, but now let's go ahead and compare it side by side to this one. This belongs to, I believe, a 2016 Les Paul Traditional. So I think that is the newest case I have here. This difference happened last year where they dropped the USA branding of the case. So that's nothing too new. The outside Tolex, it's a little bit different. This one has a little bit more of a textured rubbery vibe to it, whereas this feels more smooth. You hear the difference? You're gonna notice that the latches are a little bit different. These ones look cheaper to me. They just look a little bit bulkier in the way that they mount. These kind of had a nice, you know, Gibson-esque vibe to them. They're very stylized. But something that this case does have over that is it does have a key. I'd never realized that these ones did not have a lock. These older style ones used this one where you could put a padlock over it, which is probably a superior way to lock your case down. Now, most people don't lock their cases, but that is something these guys have got going for them. And here you can kind of see what I was talking about earlier. This handle, it just feels like it has more padding. Honestly, I think this one's a little bit more comfortable, though. This and you can see the mounting bracket is a little bit different as well. But this is the biggest difference that I did not notice until I was shooting the B-roll footage. So you see this right here? It's covered in the same Tolex material. But this is actually plastic on these cases now. Once you see it, you don't unsee it. You see how that's a completely different color there? And it just has a, a much cheaper feel to it. I didn't notice that until I felt the case right here. So this is the older style one. And here's that new one. So I'm wondering if over time that these will deteriorate. I mean, I'm talking like 20, 30, 40 years down the road. Will we be talking about, oh yeah, those cases just naturally fall apart. It makes me wonder if the stitching is even real or do they just glue this stuff on or secure it with that. As far as the inside of the cases, not too much has changed. Even the pull tabs are in the same location. They both read Gibson. This one's a little bit more pink. Last year's was red. They're always changing the interior colors. But the last difference that I noticed is you see how small this area is. It's not like completely bunched up. Whenever I see something like that, it reminds me of one of those cheap cases because they usually have something that looks like this. Like it's similar to what is offered by the Epiphones. So it's still a nice case. It's just kind of cool to compare the differences between them here. The only really downside that I see is the, the plastic coating here because once you see it, you don't unsee it. 
And if you're upset by these being made in China and not in USA, well, <laughs> they never made their Gibson USA cases in America anyways. They usually came up from Canada, from TKL. They also had some Costa Rican made cases as well as a few other locations. With the whole coronavirus stuff going on, they might regret making their cases in China. <laughs> So, if you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this Gibson Les Paul Slash signature from the USA collection here, this one's already spoken for. I can probably help you get another one. But just in case he rejects this one based off of condition, you can check out that link in the description that will take you to the Reverb for Sale page. Thank you, Troglodytes, for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.